Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening and welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. We are here this evening with Dr. Kevin Lamb. Dr. Lamb is a practicing uh, podiatrist and reconstructive foot and ankle surgeon from uh, Naples, Florida. And uh, we're happy to have you here tonight. And we're going to be, well, we will be talking about uh, reconstructive surgery for the foot and ankle. Uh, there are not there many podiatry surgeons that do that. Dr. Lamb is one of them. We'll also be talking about adult flat feet, among other things. And Dr. Lamb, maybe you could just give us a little background about yourself and your practice and the different locations where you are. And I know, uh, you know, you do your surgery at the different hospitals here. Uh, maybe touch base on that a little. Yes, um, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I uh, went to undergrad in Connecticut as well as Pennsylvania. Uh, Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine for podiatry school and then did my training at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami as well as Mount Sinai Medical Center and the Temple Health Systems in Philadelphia. And, um, and our locations, uh, we have three locations in, uh, in Naples now. We've grown to, uh, we have one in uh, downtown Naples, um, 661 Goodlett. We have one in East Naples, uh, across from Lady Horses on 41. And then we have one in North Naples that just opened about a year ago, up on Immokalee, uh near Goodlett Road. So I know you've been expanding your practice. You started practice here, what, five, ten years ago, maybe? Actually, eight, about eight years ago? Started, it yes. seems like time has flown, but the, uh, Dr. Lamb has multiple partners now in multiple locations, and we're glad to have him because he's really good at what he does. Tell us a little bit about, um, well, you can start where you want to start talking about tonight. Well, um, a, a very interesting topic, a very confusing topic for, for, uh, for referring physicians as well as for patients is uh, flat feet. You know, we have uh, kids with flat feet and we have adults with flat feet. So we'll start off with the kids. Uh, we do see kids that, that is a, uh, that's something that a lot of doctors don't see it in Collier County, um, the adult doctors, but we do see kids. We do see kids as young as when they're fr first born till all the way up to they're 18 uh, for kids. So pediatric flat foot, a lot of times pediatricians will, do, I, I see two classes of pediatricians around, around here. They have some that every child with a flat foot that comes and see us, that's great because that way we could we could go and triage these patients and find out, okay, are these patients that are going to need surgery or they're going to have problems in the future, or are these patients just going to do well with just monitoring, good shoe wear, education, and possibly orthotics. Not every kid needs orthotics, so that's something that is good for us to help, help decide via x-rays and uh, examination and talking to the parents. So, but... Um, it's, it's, it's a, well, Cuyahoga County is uh, an unusual place because many times pediatric patients are not seen by physicians other than pediatricians, but s surgical subspecialists. So this is really an advantage, I think. Can you tell our audience what a flat foot is or why it happens? Or Well, um, a flat foot is when the, the arch is collapsed. We, are, we all have a, we are, are supposed to have an arch and we have high arches, middle arches, and flat arches. And uh, you want to be in the middle. People with high arches have their set of issues too, but people with uh, flat feet are the ones that um, are actually very amenable to uh, surgical, surgical correction if we, if we have to do it. Um, high arch feet, surgical correction is um, not as successful. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you, were, you were starting to say in pediatrics, if you see a child, some, you can determine so if something needs to be done early. How, what, what would you see? How would you decide that? What, what is it exactly that you're changing? Well, for a child, if we see something called a vertical talus, which is uh, one of the bones in the, in the foot that is supposed to be pointing down at about 15 degrees, but instead is pointing straight down at the ground on the x-ray, we know that is something called a rigid flat foot. That thing is a rigid flat foot. It will not go away with, with conservative care. That's something that needs to be addressed early, surgically, so the child does not grow up to be an adult with severe deformities and pain with a larger reconstructive surgery in the future. Those uh, kids, we catch them early, it could be as simple as putting a pin in the, in, the, in the kid's foot just to realign them until their soft tissue um, adapts around it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in those kind of cases, we like to get them early. How, how early is early? 
Gosh, as early as when they start walking, some kids are like 10, really? 11, 12 months old, you know, the parents say, hey, the, my child doesn't like to walk or my child keeps on falling. Hey, my child's a year and a half old and doesn't like to walk. And they feel, they see a little bump in the arch. You know, that's, that's something that we should look at. Well, what if it's not corrected at the proper time? Well, in those cases with a kid with a rigid flat foot, if they're not corrected at the appropriate time, then, then when they get older, we need to do bone work. And they're not amenable to like a soft tissue pinning where we just put a pin in there so that the soft tissue develops around it. Um, then we're dealing with cutting a bone, taking bones out, and the, the surgery becomes a lot more complicated that, at that point. So are you saying if, it's, if you correct it early with a pin or something simple and then the soft tissue around it uh, becomes strong and, and, and maintains that position, is that all? They don't have to have surgery again? Uh, most of the time, no. Most of them, they do not uh, require surgery again. Or if they do require surgery, something really minor, or they could live the rest of their life with an orthotic device in their shoe. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of those things, the, the quicker we get to them, the better. Um, I have a perfect example of, um, of a child, uh, two, two brothers. I have a, a young brother and an older brother. The older brother is 18 right now. And um, the mother brought him in. The mother, the mother, the, no, this guy can't play sports or anything, and, and his foot is very flat, and he's having tons of trouble. Well, at, at 18, at that point, his tendon, was, he's sort of on the borderline of what we call an adult flat foot already, so he developed a, a tendon injury. Uh, his tendon ruptured and ended up doing a major reconstruction on the one foot. And now that the mother knows about it, she, she wants to immediately fix the other, the contralateral, the other foot, mm -hmm. so he doesn't end up having the same problem. So I did that. I did a major reconstruction on one side, a minor surgery on the other side. And then she brought in her uh, three-year-old child with the same exact issue as she remembers the brother going through this at, when he was that age, and she does not want this young one to undergo the same, same issues. So tendon rupture can occur if it's not corrected. What, what other things can happen if the flat foot is, is it just a matter of pain or are there other injuries that can occur? Um, pain, disability, um, you could have a certain type of ankle fracture based on the, based on the uh, position of your foot, and those can be very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Then we're dealing with um, ankle fusions and a bunch of uh, more complicated surgeries then. But uh, tendon injury, I mean, you could, you could deal with, we could have back, knee problems, back problems, hip problems for the poor mechanics mm -hmm. as they're developing. Goes right up to the hip, all the way. And all the, the way, yeah. And the back. Huh? Definitely. So, um, what, um, in terms of, what would somebody expect from a surgical procedure, such as a flat foot procedure? What, what would happen? Well, uh, flat foot reconstruction could be as simple as we could put in a plug in one of the joints to hold every, to bolster everything up. That could be for minor cases that are flexible. It could be as, you know, a moderate one could be us putting a little bone graft in one of the bones to just shift everything into place. That's a moderate one. And then a more major one, we could start fusing bones to put them exactly where we want it. It's almost like putting a puzzle together. Mm -hmm. But the surgeon has to have the knowledge and experience in how to put this together because you have to, you have to plan the cuts, you have to put them in the exact position because this, this patient is going to live with that foot for the rest of their life. We need to be able, the surgeon has to have, be able to have the experience and the foresight to know where to put this bone. Mm -hmm. hmm. And it's a day uh, outpatient surgery or? Yes. Oh. It is a day surgery nowadays uh, because the, anesthesi the anesthesia staff at Naples Community Hospital, where I do a majority of my reconstructive cases, they're excellent in regards to providing a block. They will numb you up from the knee down. The patient won't feel pain or any sensation for 24 hours. So the patients are, are in the operating room. It, they won't feel a thing. They'll be relaxed, and they wake up quickly from the anesthesia, and they go home the same day without any pain and without the risk of um, hospital-acquired infections. Mm -hmm. You. Uh as I remember at one time, did you say you have a staff that just works with you on your surgery at, at the hospital or a, that's constant, the same? Or yes, we have, we have a consistent uh, staff at the hospital that is dedicated to foot and ankle. We have a dedicated room to foot and ankle at the hospital. Every Friday, we have all our special instrumentations. I mean, when I first came to town about eight years ago, some of the very rudimentary tools for foot and ankle reconstruction was nowhere to be found. But now we've gotten to the point of having these special instruments. And it's uh, great for the patient because now we can 
do minimally invasive surgery to correct front ankle deformity just because we have the, we have the experience of not only us, the surgeons, but also of the techs, of the anesthesia, who knows what we, what we want and need in the operating room. That's great. That's great. That, that, that's interesting because it just leads me to, right, right before we started, we had a conversation about what podiatrists do, what the foot and ankle uh, surgeon specialist does, and, and I think there's still some confusion even among physicians, but more so among patients, about who are you, what do you do, what does a podiatrist do? Can you tell us about that more for, for our, our patients that are listening? Well, there's, there's definitely a, a lot of confusion out there and um, amongst patients and among physicians, too, among our referring physicians also. There's, in Cuyahoga County, we are very lucky to have some very highly trained podiatrists in, in this town because the hospital requires you to be at least board certified or qualified in at least foot surgery to be on staff. So the so majority of the podiatrists here are excellent with the with the foot surgery. But when you go behind that and you go to the ankle and the the hind foot and we're dealing with the complicated flat foot reconstruction, in reality we're the only practice that does it because in the country there's only nine hundred fifty double board certified doctors. You have to be double board certified by American Board of Podiatric Surgery to show you're proficient at doing these reconstructive cases. You've been proven and in the board of your peers and they look at your case and make sure you have the proper outcomes and you not deal with complications and um, that is something that we offer in our practice that nobody else seems to offer. So that's like you're, 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 you're a trained surgeon but then that's a surgical subspecialty so to speak is that is that what you mean? We are a uh, surgi we are surgical subspecialty yes and also a subspecialty within podiatry itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we deal with, um, a lot of times I get the confusion also on both sides. I get the confusion of, doctor, do you take care of warts? Yes, I take care of warts. I'm still a podiatrist. <laughs> right. I take care of ingrown toenails. On the other hand, I can fix your ankle fracture. I can fix your flat foot while I fix your bunion. So we offer a, a whole wide array of, um, of um, treatments for anything with the front ankle we're able to handle. And the technology, um, when we first met, which was a while back, you came to, to my office and you brought some material with you. I remember this. And I was very amazed at the technology that you were showing me because not only was I unaware of the technology, but I didn't know a podiatrist did what you were showing me. So, and, that, and that's the surgical component, the subspecialty component, that this is what orthopedic surgeons do in some communities. That's what you're doing here. Correct. Um, some orthopedic front ankle surgeons, uh, some orthopedic surgeons take an extra year of training after orthopedic surgery to do front ankle. And some of them are excellent at it. Um, but we're all individuals. We have some podiatrists that, you know, are variable and some orthopedic surgeons are variable. So you can't judge them by profession, whether you're a podiatrist or an orthopedic surgeon. It's more about experience, consistency, and results. Um, and, and I'm happy to announce that you know, we've, been, we've been chosen and we also have chosen a fellow next year to start training at our facility for these reconstructive cases because there is a need as our, aging, as our population ages and they, they're still very active. We, have, we see a lot more of these wear and tear and also reconstructive cases that need to be done. So we are training other doctors now post-residency to do the stuff that we do because there is a need and there is a lack of that not only here, but in the country. Yes, where are you bringing physicians from to train them? Where are they coming from? Well, they're applying from all over the United States now. Well, we picked one already for this upcoming year. Mm -hmm. um, next year, we're gonna expand to the world um, to get orthopedics or podiatrists that are interested in uh, doing an extra year of additional training. And uh, <clears throat> not to get off that subject is that we talked about children's flat foot. What's the difference between how you treat an adult's flat foot? Well, is a there a difference? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, so an adult not. flat foot is usually, is usually uh, they fall into two categories. Either they, they, are, they are acquired, which means they've injured a tendon and they started to collapse over time over a year or so, or they were neglected flat foot when they were a child. So we treat those very differently. So um, in, the case, in the case of, let's say, a tendon rupture where the adult starts, pro we call it a progressive flat foot, mm -hmm. or adult acquired flat foot, that's when they injure a tendon, they start to collapse out. Those we treat by fixing the problem, which is the tendon rupture in the first place. 
and then we realign the foot if we have to. If it's, a, if it's been long-standing enough where the joint starts to fall apart, then we have to fix the joints. Um, and in the second case where they are neglected flat feet when they were a child, and now they're an adult with a painful flat foot as an mm -hmm. adult, mm -hmm. then we have to do more of a surgical fusion, putting the puzzle back together again, putting mm -hmm. bone grafts where we need it to reconfigure the three-dimensional shape of the foot in order for it to walk properly. We're going to take a, a brief break, and then we'll be back to talk more about uh, foot and ankle subspecialty surgery with you. We'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. emergency happened right now, you can have help with the push of a button with Medical Alert. Remember when I took that fall, Mary? Oh, yes, that was terrible. Yes, it was. Help! And I thought, what if you hadn't been there? I ordered my Medical Alert the next day. I can't describe how safe I feel now with my Medical Alert. You didn't know I was wearing it, did you? Medical Alert is easy to install, waterproof, and covers you inside your home and out. It helps me feel safe from fires, break-ins. And of course, a medical alert. And if you don't have a home phone, don't worry. They have that covered. There's always help at the push of a button. Don't wait till you need it. Get Medical Alert for less than a dollar a day. There are no long-term contracts. Order now and get your second button free. Call for your free brochure. For your complete medical alert system with second button free, call 800-604-2791. Welcome back to Dialogue with a Doctor. We're here this evening with Dr. Kevin Lamb. We've just been talking to him. He is a pra practicing podiatrist, I should say, first, and, and a uh, subspecialty foot and ankle specialist. He does a lot of advanced surgery. Uh, we've been talking to him in general about foot and ankle reconstruction, uh, flat feet, um, and now we're just going to move on and talk about other things. Uh, we're going to do many subjects so we can educate everybody about them as much as we can. Do you want to yes. talk about bunion surgery next? Yes, uh, bunion surgery. Bunion surgery is um, probably one of the things that people associate podiatrists with. I have a bunion, I have to go see a podiatrist. And, sure. and, and bunion surgery also has this b bad um, stigma to it, I guess, uh, in regards to a painful bunionectomy. You know, I always hear these stories, oh, my friend said she had bunion surgery, I'll never, she will never have it done again. Well, it, in training, I, I see different techniques, and I've seen, I've seen different doctors uh, perform bunionectomies, and, and the beauty of the way we do bunionectomies, or the way that um, I do bunionectomies now in, in Cuyahoga County, is that I do a minimally invasive bunionectomy, where I do a five millimeter incision on the side. And I'm able to get all the correction that I need out of that. And, um, and also, in addition to having our own anesthesia staff and our OR staff, we're able to numb these patients up for 24 hours or more so they don't feel the pain for 24 hours. They recover very well. Let, let's, if we could step back for a second, just uh, m many patients don't know what a bunion is. Um, they think it's uh, a growth on the side of their foot. And what, why are they there and what are they? Well, basically, it's a bump on the side of the uh, big toe. Uh, I've received a lot of press lately from uh, the Dr. Oz show and uh, et cetera. And um, basically, it's a bump on the side of the, of the big toe. The big toe joint is it's enlarged. Uh, mainly, it's because it's a shift of the big toe joint to the side causing that bump. It's not because it's a growth, uh, per se. It's, it's actually an angular change in the bone. A shift toward, as a patient would say, the inside. I shift towards the inside, correct, or make your foot look, look, look more like a duck feet than a regular human foot. Mm -hmm, that, that's mm -hmm. how some people uh, describe their bunions. When they come in, hey, my foot looks like a duck's feet because it's splaying out. That's uh, what a bunion is. So we can correct that. Advances have, have happened in it, and we've actually had modification procedures that we do that nobody else does in the whole country mm -hmm. in regards to the technique, uh, in regards to decreasing the amount of pain, discomfort, not even pain, discomfort to the patient and the increase mm -hmm. in recovery. They can walk the same day of surgery now from bunionectomies. So what is a bunion bunionectomy? What are you doing when you through this five millimeter? Did you say five millimeter? Five millimeters, that's all it takes. That's, We're able to that's, do it. That's, that's, how, that's do you, it. how do you do that? That's, that's, that's it. amazing. Well, now we, with advent of interoperative uh, radiography or we can see the bones in, in, mm -hmm. in surgery, we don't have to open, open up the whole foot just to, see, just to see the bone. We could see it. We could use a guide 
and then we can cut through that five millimeter, cut the bone, and shift it back in so that way it looks straight again. And, that, and that's how we, we take care so of that. So you're, you're just not shaving off bone. You're, you're actually moving, We're shifting, moving it back. Correct. We are back. shifting the joint back in alignment because just shaving off the bone was an old-fashioned procedure yes. that does not work for the long term. So you really have to shift, shift the bone into proper alignment so that it ro rotates correctly. So if you're, if you're, just to say it's bent like that, and you're shifting things back, Yes. How, how, do you, how does it stay there? What do you, how do you do that? Well, the beauty is with the 5 millimeter incision, we make a 5 millimeter incision right here, mm -hmm. and we, we, we shift it back in place. All the soft tissue is intact in there. What nature gave us when we were born is still intact. We have the tendons, we have the ligaments, we have all the neurovascular structures are all there. Mm -hmm. So we shift this bone over, and it stays in place because, because there's nothing else we move it in place, we put a little pin in there just to hold it in place for about four weeks, mm -hmm. and your body forms this bone glue in between each other, and it mm -hmm. forms in one solid bone over time. And mm -hmm. four weeks is usually what it takes to form that little bridge. So they're, they're not bearing weight for four weeks, and do they need something after that in terms of pro, uh, supports of some kind? Or? Well, actually, they're bearing weight almost immediately now. Oh, we, really? we used to take them off their feet, but because of the 5 millimeter incision now and the lack of destruction to the col or collateral damage to the other tissues, we let all that natural tissue hold the cut in place. Mm. We use one little pin to, to keep it there, but everything else holds it in place, so there's no deviation. So even when they walk on it, that fresh cut is not going to move. And that actually increases the healing rate because it puts stress on the bone and it actually increases the healing rate. The, the, the joint that you're talking about, you know, the, the big toe joint on yes. it, many times when I see the swelling there and I say, oh, what is this? And we take an x-ray and you can see um, spurring around the bone, arthritis on the joint, and at the same time it's distorted. Are, are those related to each other? Um, sometimes they are. Sometimes if you don't address a bunion deformity, when the bunion is just a, a big bump on the side, when we catch them early, there's less joint destruction. When we catch them late, there's more joint destruction. That's when you see the bone spurs. That's when you, you have these patients coming in with big, huge, inflamed joints. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, every joint that we have in our body, they're, they're approximated with cartilage. So mm -hmm. the cartilage is meant to contact a cartilage. So when a bone is off kilter, you have bone rubbing against cartilage, and it's going to wear it out. So the longer you wait, the more damage you're going to do to that joint, the more wear and tear that joint is going to suffer, and the more likelihood of us having to fuse the joint, take it away, rather than fixing your deformity, allowing you to have better range, keeping what you have naturally. Mm -hmm. And we like to get to our patient early before they start eroding away that cartilage, because we can't give that cartilage back. Once it's gone. And once it's gone, we cannot give it back in the big toe joint, at least. Mm -hmm. The, the shifting over of the bunion, that affects the other part of the, of the foot? It definitely can. Uh, when the bunion starts shifting over and you start to get that duck feet uh, look, you're st then people are going to start putting more weight on the second knuckle, third knuckle, fourth knuckle, and all the way downwards. So you're going to get hammer toes, you're going to get dislocated toes, and you're going to start walking off the side of the foot. It's going to cause some hip, back, and uh, knee pain all the, way, all the way down the line. Hmm. So having a bunion moderate to severe you're not going to walk off that bunion. Your, your body's going to shift the weight out to the outside of the foot. That's going to cause some pretty major issues down the road. How long does it take to do that type of surgery? Uh, the minimally invasive bunion surgery, the, or we call the five millimeter, or we call the Cario County uh, bunionectomy nail, nicknamed it, um, <laughs> it takes us about 15 to 20 minutes with sedation and local anesthetic in the uh, hospital. We should call that the Cario County lamb bunionectomy. Indeed. <laughs> Um, talk uh, about uh, diabetes in the foot. Can you just start wherever you'd like and talk about that? Well, um, diabetics are, are recommended to see a podiatrist once they're diagnosed. Um, we see them anywhere from a year, uh, every year or every six months or to every three months, depending on the severity of the complication. I mean, diabetes is a leading cause of amputation in the United States for non-traumatic amputation. So why is that? Because, you know, you have either A, a lack of circulation from your complication of diabetes or lack of nerve called neuropathy. You don't feel. And when you, get, when you don't feel, you get an injury to your foot. You don't see it. You don't feel it. 
by the time you, you, the patient feels it, they're in the hospital with a massive infection. And then added on to that, peripheral arterial disease, I, I tell my patients, it's almost like a heart attack of the foot. You get a blockage of an artery it going down to your foot. It is a heart attack of the foot. It is. And, yes, it is. And you end up losing a foot or a leg. Mm -hmm. And that's how that happens. So um, you also, we're not going to be able to finish this whole conversation, but you also said it costs more than certain cancers. What was it that you said? Well, a new paper came out that says the treatment for diabetic amputations costs more in the lifetime of a patient than cancer nowadays because you're talking about physical therapy. You're talking about lifetime prosthesis for these patients. And once they get an amputation of a toe or a leg, the chances of further amputation increases significantly and the mortality rate of these patients almost double at about five years. You, you have some technology in your office that you use to help figure this out when a diabetic comes in just preventatively. What, what is it that you do? Well, first we, we uh, use our hands. We check for circulation. If we can't feel the circulation or if, if it's questionable, we have something called a Doppler. The Doppler checks the circulation by hearing the blood cells go through. If, if that's good, if that's good, then we move on. We check out the nerves. We check the sensation, see if they feel me touching the bottom of their foot or using a special mm -hmm. filament. If they can't feel that, then they run into a high risk field, high risk assessment field. Then we need to see them every three months to make sure they don't get an infection, make sure there's no irritation. Get, um, the insurances will pay for a special shoe and inserts mm -hmm. for these patients so that they don't get um, irritation or infection because that is very costly when that happens. Yeah, once it's already there. So you, you can detect something or an irritation early so that you can then protect, protect it without it into a catastrophe? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so prevention is the key in this. You use ultrasounds to look at the foot as well? We do use ultrasound, but that is, uh, we use ultrasound to check the arterial flow. We okay. look at the flow of the arteries coming down. We use ultrasound to diagnose um, a, a ganglion cyst, stress fractures. We use ultrasound to help guide our injections to our targeted tissue. So we have a lot of technologies in, within the office that patients mm -hmm. do not have to leave the office to get. Yeah, I've, I've been surprised by what you have in your office, or at least from what I've been told. I have not been in your office yet, but I'd like to see it someday. Um, what, we're almost, we're, well, we're all, we're, we'll be running out of time in just a second, mm -hmm. but um, we want to thank you for coming, and we, we, we'd like you to come back and uh, talk more about some other subjects on the foot. We've talked to your partner. Is it Brian Tim? Yes, Brian Tim. Yep, we talked to your partner. We learned a lot from him. And uh, once again, we thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me. I'd like thank to have you. you come back. So. Definitely. Yeah. yeah.